Hello and welcome back to another day in the YSI plenary. This is day eight. We've been already going strong for a week, but there's more to come. Today is another day packed with questions fair sessions. Shortly, you will hear from Justin Lin in the globalization constellation. But I can already tell you that later today, we will also have Julia Steinberger, Stephanie Blankenberg, and Stephanie Griffith Jones. So I'm sure you're as excited as, that, as excited as I am to get started. If you've been with us for the past week, you probably know that these sessions are something you can not just watch, but also participate in directly. There's a process for you to suggest the research questions for YSI to the speaker for them to reflect on them. But if you're new, don't worry. Here's a little video that explains to you how this works. First, go to ysiplenary.org and click the night sky. This is the questions fair, where each star is a question and each group of stars or constellation contains questions within a particular topic. You can find questions fair sessions in the schedule in the left sidebar and join them from there. Just enter the session and join the Zoom. As you listen to the speaker motivate their questions, Think about which questions you believe to be pertinent for YSI. While the speaker talks, suggest your questions to your peers by entering them into the panel. This is not a Q&A. The questions are suggestions for research in YSI, not a question for the speaker to answer. Take a look at all the questions that were suggested and like the ones that you think are best. The questions moderator will select the most liked questions and present them to the speaker for a comment. These questions will be added to the constellation where they can be further refined. Refine the questions by finding the best exact phrasing. Suggest a rephrasing yourself or like the rephrasings that you think are good. After the session is over, you can find the submitted questions in the constellations. As a plenary participant, you can mark your 10 favorite questions in the graph. Just click the star in the corner of the questions card and they will be added to your YSI profile. The most popular questions will make it into the final list. All right, with that, I think you're ready to get sent over to the globalization constellation and hear from our speaker, Justin Lin. You'll be welcomed by our questions moderator, Alexander. Localize or globalize, localize or globalize, localize or globalize, interwoven or broken lines, globalize or localize, globalize or localize, globalize or localize, the globe is wide, I don't know your lives, globalize or localize, human beings are social, we gather to the center where the energy is focal, let's share a Coca-Cola, give yourself a to the total, but if everyone lives everywhere, then no one is at home though. Where you go depends on where you start. It's mega corporations and global markets. It's Darwinistic. It's are you fitter? The globe is big, but the market's bigger. How big's too big? How far is the chart of the growth extend? And when's it start to hold its stock but lose its heart? A unity that destroys its parts. Localize or globalize? Localize or globalize? Localize or globalize? Interwoven or broken lines? Globalize or localize? Globalize or localize? Globalize or localize? Or go for both with open eyes. Hi everyone, welcome again to the Globalization Constellation this time around. Uh, another session in our question uh, fair. Uh, today we are gonna be listening to Justin Lin and as you have heard from Heske um, in the video, as all of these days, first we are gonna start by suggesting new questions related to the talk. And uh, these questions will uh, be then liked by uh, uh, the participants and the most liked ones will be commented upon by the speaker. We will then turn to uh, rephrasing the most liked questions. So please do submit any ideas of how we could think about the issues that Justin Lin talks about and what questions we could ask him. Thank you. And without further ado, uh, I invite Sun Kim to take over. 
Thank you, Shasha. Hello, YSI Universe. It's Friday, but our journey and endeavor to find economic questions continue. Welcome to Questions Fair with Professor Justin Ifilin on the globalization constellations. I would like to extend our deep gratitude warm welcome to Professor Lin today. Professor Justin Lin is Dean of Institute of New Structural Economics, Dean of Institute of South-South Cooperation and Development, and Professor and Honorary Dean of National School of Development at Peking University. He was the Senior Vice President and Chief Economist of the World Bank from 2008 to 2012. Prior to this, Professor Lin served for 15 years as founding director and professor of the China Center for Economic Research at Peking <clears throat> University. He is a counselor of the State Council and a member of the Standing Committee, Chinese People's Political Consultation Conference. He is the author of more than 20 books, including Beating the Odd, Jumpstart Developing Countries, Going Beyond the Aid, Development Cooperation for Structural Transformation, The Quest for Prosperity. How developing economies can take off new structural economics, a framework for thinking, development, and policy against consensus, reflections on the Great Recession, and demystifying the Chinese economy. He's a corresponding fellow of the British Academy and a fellow of the Academy of Sciences for Developing World. Well, you can read many of his interesting essays, great essays, via the Project Syndicate World Bank blogs. There's also in a video interview with Professor Lin. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Lin. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the nice introductions. And the main message I'd like to present in this talk is that the ignorance of the indigeneity of economic structure is the main reason for the mainstream economics and also development policies in the developing country to fail. So let me repeat. My main message is that the ignorance of the indigeneity of economic structure is the main reason for the values of modern economics and development policy in a developing country. So let me elaborate it. <clears throat> to become a dynamically growing high-income country is a dream shared by all the developing countries, especially after the Second World War, most developing countries gaining political independent from the colonial powers and started and started their own industrialization and uh, modernization drives. And now 75 years have passed. And among about 200 developing countries after the Second World War, only two have moved from low income to high income. One is South Korea, the other one is Taiwan, China. And the mainland China, <clears throat> mother time of 2025, is likely to be the third one to move from low income to high income. And in 1960s, there were 101 middle income economies. And among those, you know, 110, by the time I became the chief economist of the World Bank in 2008. Only 13 of them moved from middle income to high income. And among those 13, eight were European countries surrounding Western Europe, like Spain, Portugal, Greece. Their income gap with the advanced Western economies Western European countries was small to begin with, were oil producing country. And the other five were Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. So from this in our statistics, 
the phenomena, the result of the modernization drive in the developing world is very disappointing. <clears throat> and the nature of modern economic growth featured by you know, continuing to grow of per capita GDP. It's a process of continuous structural transformation in technologies and industries, which increase labor productivity and in solve and hard infrastructure, which reduce trans transaction cost. I think this process is understandable to almost everyone in the global development communities. And in this process of structural transformation, developing countries have the advantage of backwardness in technological innovation, industrial upgrading, institutional innovation. So developing countries should potentially grow faster than the advanced country and achieve the convergence of their income to high income status. However, most developing countries have been trapped in the low income or middle income status after the Second World War. So this phenomenon is puzzling. And uh, I think the reason why they fail is due to the ideas embedded in the existing modern economics. And just like Ken said, it is ideas, not vested interest, which are dangerous for good or evils. So we need to review the development economic theory and the development ideas. Development economics is a new subdiscipline in modern economics after the Second World War. So many countries want to modernize their nation and there was a need to guide their development policies. And so development economics became a new subdiscipline in modern economics. The first generation of development economics is structuralism. And according to the structuralism, how come the developing country, they were so poor, was because they did not have the advanced large scale capital intensive modern industries. And certainly those industries were desirable. However, in the market economy, they could not develop spontaneously. So the perception at that time, there was certain kind of structural rigidity to cause the market value. So they could not develop those kind of modern industries spontaneously. And because of that, certainly government need to play a proactive role to overcome the market values and to adopt certain kind of input substitution strategies to mobilize resources by the government and to invest in those kind of large scale modern industry directly. And I think the goal certainly was desirable, but the result of those kind of input substitution strategy was very disappointing. And after those kind of modern industries were set up, they all became some kind of white elephant, white, you know, white elephant. They could not perform, the economy became stagnant and uh, hit by crisis all the time and the gap with the high-income country continued to be widening. As a result, development thinking changed to the neoliberalism and the new institutional economics. And the perception in the 1980s, 1990 was that the reason why the developing country performed so poorly was because you know, too many government interventions caused government failures. And if they want to have good performance, they need to have a modern, well-functioning market institutions as in a high-income country. And the recipe was the Washington Consensus and the advice was to carry out the Washington Consensus in a Big Ben approach, in a short therapy. And certainly most developing country in the 1980s, 1990s, follow this kind of, you know, policy advice, and especially you know, promoted by the Bretton Woods Institution in the program, so-called the Structural Adjustment Programs, and to implement privatization, 
marketization, stabilization. But the result was even worse. Most of the country carry out this kind of program. Their economy collapsed, stagnant, hit by crisis all the time. And the growth rate in the 1980s was even lower than the 1960s, 1970s during the structuralism periods. And the frequencies of crisis was even higher in the later period than the previous periods. And uh, during this period of time, there were a few successful economies. And uh, the most important one was in 1960s, 1970s, the East Asian economy, uh, like Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, they grow very dynamically. And they did not follow in persecution. They adopted export promotion. They did not, you know, uh, started with the development of large scale capital intensive industry. They started with some kind of small scale traditional labor intensive industry. And those kind of industry or those kind of approach in the 1950s, 60s, 70s were considered as a wrong approach by the structuralism, but they were the only successful economy during that period of time. And in the 1980s, 1990s, during the transition period, the structural adjustment periods, China, Vietnam, Mauritius did very well, but they did not follow Washington consensus to use shock therapy. They adopt certain kind of piecemeal gradual dual track approach in the transition, continue to provide some subsidies and protection to the older sectors and liberalize the entry to the new sectors. And at that time, this approach was considered as the worst possible approach but they enjoy stability and dynamic economic growth. And during this period of time, those successful countries, they have something in common. They are either market-based economy or transition to market. So market seems to be very important as nearly but is then, you know, advocated. But they also have very proactive government, just like the structuralism. So they are neither in the regime of the structuralism or in the neighborhoodism. regime. And uh, certainly with this kind of review of history, we need to have a rethinking of the development ideas or the development economics. How come follow the mainstream ideas always is a prescription for failures. And uh, those successful one, their policy often were considered as wrong policies. And uh, so <clears throat> that's what, the new structure economics try to achieve. And when I started to advocate the new structure economics, I would say we should go back to the Adam Smith, but not to the idea advocated by the Adam Smith in his book of the Wealth of Nation, but go back to the methodology of Adam Smith, which he used to get his findings. And this approach actually is exemplify in the title of his book. That is an inquiry into the nature and the causes of the wealth of nation, of the wealth of nation. So if we want to promote modern economic growth in a developing country to achieve dynamic, inclusive, sustainable growth, we need to understand the nature of the modern economic growth. And the nature of modern economic growth is a process of continuous structural transformation, including the structure of technology and industry, which increase labor productivities and uh, continuous improvement in the you know, hot infrastructure and soft infrastructure that's institution to reduce transaction costs. As I mentioned, that is known to almost everyone in the development communities. And I would like to and advocate the use of the neo neoclassic approach to study the determinant of the economic structure and its evolution. Because we know the nature, now we need to identify the causes. And I would like to use the neoclassic approach to study that. And uh, by the convention, I should refer this type of research as institutional economics, just like if you use the neoclassic approach to study agriculture is agricultural economics. To study finance, then it is financial economics. 
and I want to study structure and structural transformation, it should be structural economics. But because the first generation of development economics is structuralism, and I want to, I want to distinguish myself from the structuralism, so I refer to that as new structural economics. Just like a new institutional economics, Douglas, Douglas knows, and I started to advocate the use of neoclassical approach to study institution and an institutional evolution. Then he should refer his study as institutional economics. But because in the US at the end of 19th century, beginning of the 20th centuries, there was an institutional school. And to distinguish his approach from the institutional school, he referred his type of research as new institutional economics. So new to the new structure economics had the same meaning as new to the new institutional economics. And the main ideas, the main argument is that economic structure in a developing country is endogenous to its endowment structure. Why is that? Because the endowment structure in a developing country or in any country is given at any given time but change over, over time first. Secondly, the endowments is the total budget of an economy at any given time. And its structure, you know, relative abundance in the capital or in labor force and so on, will determine the relative prices of the factors. And then it will determine the sectors or the industry, the countries have, the country, you know, have the competitive advantages. And uh, if you develop your, econ your industry according to your competitive advantages, the factor cost of production will be lowest. And those kind of industrial structure should be considered as the optimal industrial structure because your production cost will be the lowest. And uh, the country also need to have an appropriate institution and infrastructure to reduce transaction cost. But what kind of infrastructure institution are endogenous to the industrial structure. And for us, certainly, we want to have dynamic growth in the income. But if you want to have dynamic growth of income, certainly, you need to upgrade your industries from an you know, agrarian you know, economy to manufacturing sectors, and you need to move up the, the, the manufacturing ladders. But since industrial structure is endogenous to the endowment structure, if you want to have a structural you know, transformation in your industry, you need to upgrade your endowment structure from relative abundance in natural resources or in level force to become relative abundant in capital. If you have those kind of transformation, your competitive advantage changes, then you can upgrade your industries. But certainly in this process, you also need to improve your heart and soul structure. So when we see a country is trapped in low income status or middle income status, that means the country you know, does not have a dynamic structural changes faster than the high income country. Then they will be trapped in low income status or in middle income status. And from this analysis, the best way to achieve dynamic and sustainable growth is to follow the competitive advantages determined by the country's endowment structure to develop the industry. And uh, if you do that, you can achieve dynamic economic growth and a convergence. Because if your economy follow your competitive advantages, the factor cost of production will be lowest. And if the government, if you also have the adequate high and soft infrastructure, transaction costs will be lowest also. Then certainly, then we will be most competitive. You can generate profit, economic surplus. You can accumulate capitals, and also the investment can enjoy the highest possible return. So you will have a high incentive to make investment, and then capital will be accumulated. Competitive advantage will be changing, and you will provide the material foundation for industrial grading. Then, for a developing country in the upgrading process, they can also enjoy that they come out advantages. And so a developing country by following its competitive advantages, they can grow faster than the developed country. 
But to follow the competitive advantages is a term only understandable to economists. How can we make this is become some kind of spontaneous choices of the entrepreneur of the firms? Then we need to have an institution that is to have a competitive market. Because if you want the firm to follow the factor endowments to choose your technology and industries, then you need to have a relative, pri relative prices we can, which can reflect relative abundance of the factor endowments in your economy. And only in a competitive market, the relative factor prices will reflect the relative abundance of your factor endowments. So competitive market system will be needed. But the state also need to play a very important role because we are not talking about static allocation of resources. We are talking about a dynamic structure transformation, dynamic upgrading of industries. And uh, you need to address the externality generated by the first movers in technological innovation and that's upgrading because the first movers will bear more risk and uh, uh, them the latecomers, them the followers. And their success of a failure will provide information for the you know, followers. And so you need to compensate for the externality generated by them. But the success of the first mover will also depend on whether you have adequate institution and infrastructure. And those kind of improvement cannot be carried out by the entrepreneur themselves. You need to have a state to help those kind of improvement. So to be successful, a uh, developing country also need to have a facilitation state. And from this analysis, we can understand how come structuralism fail. Because structuralism ignore the indigeneity of economic structure. And advising the developing country to develop industries which are modern, which uh, at once, but which went against the country's compared advantages. If the industries in the priority sectors went against the country's compared advantages, then the firm in those kind of industries were not viable in open competitive markets. And unless the government, you know, gave them protection and subsidies, otherwise no one known to invest in those kind of sectors. But if the government gave the subsidy and protections, will be in all kinds of distortion and interventions, causing resource allocation, you know, to have a misallocation and also create all kinds of rent and rent seeking. And certainly the performance will be poor. And uh, the dynamic growth in East Asian economies, you know, they started with very intensive military transition sector. Those kind of sectors were consistent with their competitive advantages and with their active government facilitation. So that's the reason why they can grow dynamically. And then from this analysis, we will also understand how come Washington consensus failed? Because all the transition economies, they started with many non-viable firms in the oil priority sectors due to those kind of sectors went against the country's competitive advantages. But Washington consensus neglected or ignore those kind of distortion and protections are endogenous to the need of protecting non viable firms in the priority sectors. And then when you try to remove all those kind of distortions, certainly you're causing the collapse of those kind of economies. And also Washington consensus, you know, they threw the baby out together with the buzzword. They advised the government should not do any facilitation for the new industry to emerge. They argue that once you have well-functioning market, you know, then the structural transformation will occur spontaneously. However, without government compensation for the externality and the coordination in the improvement of hardware in soft in infrastructures, then the industry will not emerge spontaneously. And the result of the corruption of all sectors and lack of emergency in the new sectors is the so-called deindustrialization in the transition economies, which you observe in North America or in Africa, in South Asia, as identified by Daniel Roger. So from this analysis, 
we need to have some, you know, and how come there are some country who are successful in the transition, like China, Vietnam, and uh, Mauritius, because they adopted some kind of pragmatic, uh, gradual approach. On the one hand, the government continued to provide some subsidy and protection to the non viable perform in the old priority sectors to maintain stability. And their government also actively facilitating the growth, the entry to the new industry, which are consistent with their comparable advantages by setting up special economic zone, one-stop service by active investment promotion and so on. And so they can achieve stability and dynamic economic you know, transformation uh, during their transition period. So from this analysis, from this analysis, you know, my concluding remark is very simple. Among the modern mainstream economic theories, most of, most of them are generated in the developed countries, are uh, either a structure, you know, if you read the modern economics in general, there are one sector models. One sector model, you know, there was, there is no qualitative difference between the developed country or developing country. And that there are only a quantitative difference, but we know developed country and developing country, there are qualitative difference. Or they use the high income country structure as the implicit structure, as the idea structure. And they may pin all the problem in the developing country to the high income country. And they see any difference from the structure of high income country as a distortion and advise the developing country to remove those kind of distortions. However, the structural differences are endogenous, but the modern economics, not only in the development or in transition, in almost every subfield of modern economics, they explore this kind of structural differences and the endogeneity in the structure. And my new, my new structural economics, take the structural differences and their endogeneity explicitly. And this kind of new, you know, ideas embedded in what I call, I call the zero generation of development economics, that is new structural economics, can provide hope and help to developing country. And from the new structural economics, every developing country has the potential, has the potential to grow dynamically for decades and then to become a middle income or even a high income country in one or two generations. As long as the government in a market economy facilitate the private sectors to develop along the lines of the country's competitive advantages and tap into the labor commerce advantages. And to achieve that, a change in mindset is necessary. In the past, the development thinking always used the advanced country as a reference and advise the developing country to develop what the high income country had, but they did not have, or you know, to do what the high income country can do relatively well, but they could not do well. And, uh, I, and uh, that kind of approach, certainly the intention is good, but the result in general is poor. And the new structural economics, just the object, always use the country itself as referenced to look at what the, what the country itself has. That is their, their endowment structure. And based on what they have, they can do well, certainly. That is their competitive advantages. Then the government play a facilitation role to scale up what they can do well in a market economy. And if they can change this mindset, every developing country has the potential to grow dynamically for several decades and get out of the low income trap, the middle income trap, and become a high income country. So if you are interested in this idea, you can refer to my book, Economic Development and Transition, The New Structural Economics, and uh, between the arts, the quest for prosperity, as well as if you want to understand the story about China better, you can read demystifying the Chinese economy. And if you want to understand how to apply this kind of 
idea in the multilateral development institution international cooperation. Then you can read my book, uh, going beyond X. So let me stop here. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you my ideas. Thank you, Professor Lin. It was an absolutely great, excellent presentation of your arguments. So I do agree then that I was able to find some clues where we can answer to the puzzling questions that the, the origins of a divergence between developed countries and developing countries. And your answer uh, tells us that we need to understand the different experience and structure or the different context of developing countries. So as a result, we need to pay attention to the structural problems and the structure of developing countries, not that of the developed countries. So I will move on to the, the three questions raised from the, the question room. The first question is, is the internationalization of the renminbi a condition for China to fulfill its geopolitical ambitions? Professor. Well, I think that the internationalization of a currency is a process. It will be a result of the in a growing weight of China's economy in China's development. And uh, you know, certainly this is a reasonable, researchable question. Some people will see that it's a necessary conditions for the China to become a major power. And uh, but if you look Historically, the U.S. economy overtook the Britain economy, the U.K. economy in 1870s. But U.S. dollar did not become a global reserve currency after the Second World War. So I think this is a debatable. Some people think that the internationalization of the Chinese currency is a precondition for China to become a major power, to have an influence in the geopolitical you know, areas. But as an economist, if I look into the historical experiences, I'm not convinced by the argument. And from what I see, it's more like a consequence of China's development. China now is the largest trading countries. And China also increased its foreign, its capital outflow. And that gradually, maybe the exchanges, the trade with China, you know, people may see it's more convenient to use Chinese currency as a denominator. And uh, that will increase the acceptance of the Chinese currency. And, uh, but to change from, uh, you know, global reserve currency to another global reserve currency, sometimes it also requires some kind of historical, you know, incidents. If there was no the Second World War, I think the British pound will, be, will continue to be the main global reserve currency, then global, you know, unit of count in trade, even, you know, after the Second World War, because it used, as I said, it maintained the status after 70 years, the size of the UK was overtaken by the US. So that's certainly, you know, I don't, I, I don't have a, you know, my position is more spontaneous position. My position is that most likely this has to be a process of development, but it's not a precondition for China to become a major power. Thank you, Professor. I think it was a really great history course on the complex question of the choice of reserve currency throughout the history of the 19th and 20th century. So let me move on to the second question. In the context of economic globalization and asymmetric power relations, how can transition countries of the post-Soviet region achieve economic development? 
Well, I think that mostly it related to your own choice about how to carry out this kind of transition. Certainly, we understand the planning economy was inefficient. And that's the reason why a country want to transit from the, trend, the, the planning economy to a market economy. The goal certainly is very clear, but it's a process. The Washington consensus advised the developing country in a transition to carry out marketization, privatization, and the you know, stabilization simultaneously. And to remove the, all the government intervention in the economy simultaneously. Because at the time, the understanding was, if you want to have a well-functioning market economy, you need to have basic institution for market economies. And so a lot of price to be determined by the market supply and demand, market competition, and use the price to guide the resource allocation, then the government cannot, should not set up the prices, should allow market to set up the prices. So that's marketization. But if you want to use the prices to guide the resource allocation, then you cannot have a state ownership in the firm. Because understanding at that time, if the firms are owned by the state, they will not be responsive to the price signals because for state-owned firms, if their input prices increases, they do not care. Because if the input prices increases, and uh, according to the market economy, they should economize the use of, of the inputs. But as they own the prices, yet they do not care because if they have losses, the state will subsidize them. And so there's no incentive for them to economize. And also if their output prices increase, then according to market economy, the firm should have incentive to produce more. But if the firms are owned by the state, they make more profit, they remit all the profit to the state, they are not benefited. So under that kind of situation, the argument for privatization to be, seems to be very convincing. And if you want to have a price to guide the resource allocation, you should not have the high inflation and the inflation expectation. Otherwise, you are going to have panic buying. You are going to have another you know, the firm. They do not want to share their output and so on. And, and, and so those kind of ideas seem to be very convincing. And so most countries follow that. But if you look into those countries which did not follow that, China, Vietnam did not. And actually the best performing transition economy in Eastern European country, it's Poland. But we know Poland did not privatize their large scale steel enterprises. And so they could achieve stability and so on. So I think that, that even in the Eastern European country, the government in their country still has some kind of discretion. They still have some choice about which way they want to carry out the transition. And that is the reason why I think idea is so important because the most country, most government, they follow the mainstream ideas and advice and they implement that without taking their own condition into consideration. Then under that situation, certainly their performance were poor. But if the country, they can take their own situation into consideration like Poland, they did not privatize their large scale economies. They avoid the collapse of their economy. And they also avoid the oligarch situation because you privatize all those kind of large scale owned enterprises they turn into oligarch. They have the monopoly power. And then they use their monopoly power to capture the policy, to capture the government. And the situation was even worse. So I think that that's the reason why I say 
we need to understand you know, the endogeneity of economic structure. We also need to understand the endogeneity of the distortion. And if you have those kind of understanding, you can avoid, certainly, whether this argument is conventional or not, I also hope that to have more, you know, solid, rigorous economic models and also to have more empirical evidence to support my argument. Thank you, Professor. I will just move on to the last question. To what extent have the conditions for aid of international economic institutions impeded rather than enhanced development of developing countries? Very good questions. You know, I have a book against the consensus to talk about that. And I also have another book to say going beyond AIDS to talk about what would be a much better international architecture for development in you know, our cooperation. You are right. In the past, or well, not in the past, so far, most of the aids from the international communities come with some kind of conditionalities about what you should do, or come with some kind of you know, conditionality about what is important and you should follow. If you look into the global development assistance, before the 1970s, most of the global development assistance followed the structuralism to support the development of modern industries and to invest in the infrastructure and so on. For example, we know that structuralism started in the 1940s and the father of the structuralism was Lothar Rosen. Rosen Lothar. He was the father of structuralism, and uh, he was the first research director of the World Bank. At that time, there was no chief economist, so the research director was the chief economist. The first chief economist of the World Bank was Chenery. He was a professor from the Harvard, but he was a structuralist. So at that time, the, you know, the, the, the loan or the project from the World Bank basically was guided by the structuralism and to develop modern industry, modern infrastructure and so on. Certainly with a good intention, but the result is as I described. Then after the 1980s, the global ideas became neoliberalism. The second chief economist of the World Bank, Anne Krieger. She was a, she's a champion of neoliberalism. And uh, all right, the government should not have any intervention to liberalize the operation, to remove the government from the economies. And uh, to follow that ideas, there was something called a structural adjustment law. You know, you have a crisis, you come to the World Bank, they give you some kind of loan in the name of structural adjustment. And the structural adjustment was, you know, asked the government to remove all kinds of distortions in the economy. So those kind of development aids come with those ideas. And after the 1980s, 1990s, with those kind of structural adjustment long, they did not see the performance improve. And previously, those kind of structuralist, structuralist the project, they did not see the result. So global development community started to shift. You know, they started to shift to some kind of human, humanitarian aids, education, health, and those kind of things certainly are important in high income country. They're supposed to be also important in a developing country. And like gender equality, which is very important in a high income country. And certainly they think that is also important in a developing country. And then the governance transparency, that's an important in income country. They are also assuming those are important in the developing country. So basically, the development aids always come with the ideas from the developed North. And they come with good intention, but the results in general are poor. And that's the reason why the new structure economics say, we should look at what we have first, based on what we have, what we can do well, 
And uh, the government should you know, help the private sector to scale up what they can do well. If the International Development Corporation follows that line, to look at what developing country have, based on what they have, you know, what they can do well. And then provide more resources to help the developing country to scale up what they can do well. Then those kind of development cooperation, development aid will be effective. Otherwise, good intention not necessarily will come with good results. Thank you, Professor. I think it, your uh, answers give us great inspiration, particularly for our working groups. So your speech and answers has a strong relevance to our working group activities, such as development, East Asia, economic history, even history of economic thought. So I really like appreciate your uh, participation and your great thoughts. Um, but this is the only the end of very first part. So it's time for young scholars to develop further questions. Now back to the studio, please. Thank you, Professor, for your great speech. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I'm trying to... Maybe trying. Oh, okay. Okay. Let me try again. Sorry. No, it's okay. Okay, so three, two, one. Sung Woo, and thank you especially, Justin Lin. But also thanks to all the young scholars for suggesting more questions and bringing those to the table. Right now is the chance to refine those questions and to figure out together which ones we want to add to the graph. For that, let me send you back to our questions moderator, Alexander. Hi everyone, we are back in the constellation of this quite amazing talk, at least for me. Um, it is not many of us here, but our questions are great, I would say. And we don't have that much time for our uh, rephrasing, but if we use it well, I think we're gonna come up with really great questions. Many of you, I hope, already know how this works. We have just allowed uh, for new phrasings to be added. Now, under each of the questions, you see the suggest a rephrasing for this question button uh, in yellow, and you can offer a different rephrasing. Uh, by doing that, you will um, uh, we will be able to like either one of the rephrasings, and by that, determine which is the best formulation for this particular question. At the end of the session, which will come relatively quickly, we will be then choosing our favorites among the most like for liked phrasings and formulations. Also, what is more, uh, what is also what is very important for us is that now we want to hear you. So, if you want to unmute yourself, we are really not that many, and it will be very easy for us to uh, discuss directly without uh, even raising your hands or anything. Simply unmute yourself if you have anything to say uh, with regards to the questions that we got or in general uh, with regards to the talk. Um, as far as the questions go, we can start by rephrasing the question that has gotten most of the likes for now, which is uh, in the context of economic globalization and the symmetric power relations, how can transition countries of the post-Soviet region achieve economic development? Uh, then we can turn for a bit to the question, is the internalization of RMB a condition for China to fulfill its geopolitical ambitions? And finally, we can look at the question, to what extent have the conditions for aid of international economic institutions impeded rather than enhanced development of developing countries. Um, yes, so going back to the question on, on the countries from the post-Soviet region, we would welcome any comments. We would also uh, 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 welcome rephrasings in particular. 
does anyone have any ideas how maybe we can approach this question? What could be a different way to ask it, to add some aspects to it that we haven't uh, already, uh, we don't already have in, in, the, in the current formulation? Maybe if the person that has uh, suggested this question is here, it would also be great to hear the reasoning behind that. We seem to have another phrasing coming in for this question. In the context of economic globalization and the power asymmetries in, within free, tra free trade agreements, how can transition countries of the post-Soviet uh, region achieve economic develop development? Uh, yeah, now we have the, the FTAs included as part of the question, which I prefer, but... Um, everyone can decide for themselves.
Okay, it seems like uh, there was an unfortunate technical issue where we were losing some of the sound from Sasha and the question editing session uh, over in the globalization. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, we're, going to, we're going to end the question editing session uh, now, or at least here on the feed. Uh, you still have the chance to go in and favorite the questions that were submitted. A lot of them were already submitted and it, they're in the graph now. Uh, so, if you like Thanks some of the, if you like some of the questions that were submitted, the you didn't get to favorite them in the, in the session, future, you can just go and back and into the constellation and have a look at it. Okay, so this is our last day of the questions fair, and uh, this is the graph as it looks right now. It's the same, almost Thanks the same as it looked last we, uh, we yesterday night, understand. but now we have a few more Thanks questions in the globalization constellation over here. Um, so. Let's, let's dive into the globalization constellation and see which questions are now the most favorited. Oh, Thomas is already talking, it seems. There we, we could go. potentially... Okay, we're in the globalization uh, constellation and listen, we can see yes. that the most favorited question in this constellation is still the first question that was submitted on the very first day. To what extent is the discipline of economics a part of the problem itself? Not really specifying what that problem is, but I think this is definitely a great question to start off from, and it was one of the first questions that was submitted, and it's in the lead in the globalization constellation. Uh, now, we just had the talk by uh, Justin Lin, and it seems that two of his questions have actually made it all the way up to the top three. What is the appropriate role of the state in the process of economic development and transition in a market economy? And what are the implications of structural differences between developing and developed countries for economic theories? Okay, so this is the last day. We hope that you will be taking, that you will be joining all of the question sessions today and submitting more questions. It is not the last uh, chance to submit questions for this graph. We can do it fur further on, but even uh, tomorrow and Sunday, while the working groups are having all their sessions on the ships, there will still be question submission windows where you can go in and just submit a question on your own time. But the most important thing, if you have one minute, if you're already on the YSI Plenary platform, ysiplenary.org, it may be in order to uh, go to a working group talk or in order to see a questions fair thing, make sure to mark your favorites so that you can see every time you mark favorites, this different, the size of the different stars are getting bigger. Okay, that's it for now. Uh, see you in an hour.